Hey everybody, we are talking about alignment today on uh, WebDM and especially how to uh, remove it from your game or push it into the deep background at least. Before that though, you really ought to check out our most watched video, which is our previous alignment video, where we go through all the various alignments, play everybody's favorite game of what alignment is this uh, pop culture figure. Uh, and I stand behind all of it. It's a great video. You ought to check it out. And Rick Sanchez is still chaotic evil. This episode is sponsored by Monty Cook Games and Tallis, the city by the spire, their masterwork campaign setting for 5e and the cipher system. Tallis is a fantasy city like no other. Find adventure on vibrant streets, down dangerous depths, and up its magical spire. It was derived from Monty's personal campaign, which he ran for other Wizards of the Coast designers through the development and early days of 3rd edition. So you know this is a place packed with adventure. Tallis, City by the Spire includes over a thousand pages, 672 to be exact, of campaign setting and over 300 pages of maps, handouts, and bonus content updated and refined for 5e and the Cypher system. Its careful organization and thoughtful features make it easier to use than a typical gamebook. Download the free 32-page player's guide from the MCG store or get the full book. Supplies are dwindling, so now's the time. Link in the description. So, uh, hey everybody, uh, welcome to WebDM. I am Jim Davis, and uh, today uh, I'm talking about like my favorite subject in the world, which is commenting on the commentary of D&D &D and the owners of it and their actions and the like. It's literally my favorite part of being a Dungeons and Dragons fan. Like, playing D&D is like number three-ish uh, or so, so it depends on what day of the week it is really. But Wizards of the Coast cast their uh, Tempest in a Teapot uh, enchantment uh, there in uh, mid-December and um, released uh, an errata document for Volos and an update to the player's handbook that is part of their continuing effort to just sort of clarify and update the lore of Dungeons and Dragons. And like from my point of view, it's it, 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 like it is a continuation of trends that have been in D and D, like from the beginning, uh, a, a way of saying like there is a, 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 some creatures and things in this game have tendencies to act a certain way, but like player characters and humanoids and the like are free to do what they want. To me, it's essential to the game, uh, so they're just sort of clarifying that position and updating things. Like no big deal. Um, and then <laughs> reading the responses to it, uh, and the fact that, um, like there had to be like an official post made on Reddit about it and, and, and the like was just like, wait, wait what, what, what's going on? So like <laughs> the changes themselves are really kind of minor. They're removing some specific, uh, details from Volos, uh, clarifying that it is a in-setting document written by an in-setting character and thus is biased and limited in its point of view and really only describing uh, particular peoples in a particular fantasy world in really just a corner of it right like it's it's not talking about all of the monsters uh, that uh, could be expressed through it right so it seemed like no big deal but the whole uh, <laughs> Accusations of like, you know, erasing the lore of breaking with D and D's tradition of like undermining the game and and how you play it or 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 somehow that like if you, if you didn't play in this way if you used a very strong uh, adherence to alignment that you were somehow playing wrong it was just sort of like let everybody just calm down for a second. <laughs> this seems uh, rather extreme uh, in terms of the reaction and like. The reactions that come from that part of the hobby that that are uh, well reactionary, uh, yeah, I I don't take their arguments in good faith. They, they they seem to be aimed to provoke and and just to stir the pot. But those arguments that are coming from a group of DMs and players who are saying like, wait a minute, those, those defaults that like typically they're of this alignment or have these ability score increases like that's helpful to us for establishing a baseline and for bringing in new players and like they're they seem to be upset that like that baseline is going away which from my perspective really not much has changed other than to affirm that the humanoid species and and peoples of the various D, &D worlds 
have a free will. Um, and, and if there's anything that really kind of needs to be swapped around, it's maybe like what some of the humanoids are classified as, like why gnolls aren't classified as fiends, for instance, uh, it remains a mystery to me. But like, this is the way D and D has been for a long time, like since at least third edition and, and further back. Like, original D and D has orcs listed as both neutral or chaos in terms of their alignment stance, and throughout the editions, there have been exceptions uh, the big one being drizzed right but he's not the only one <laughs> there are other monsters that have been presented as as breaking from that typical default that DD presents and showing us something different how, how expansive the game could be not to mention that there's every permutation on these uh, archetypes across the various campaign settings that D&D supports uh, in, in terms of homebrew and individual games. So Wizards of the Coast is continuing a, a long tradition of supporting a wide variety of play styles while at the same time affirming that like there's nothing inherently evil about the, the uh, people that are in these D&D worlds. Right, like some of the monsters, the fiends, the, the the outer planar creatures, that kind of thing. That that's different. They're inherently magical and the like. But if if this is a, a something that a, you know a player could choose as one of their options during character creation, then they have free will. They have moral agency. And like, I, I like that's the kind of D and I've been playing for uh, about twenty years or so myself. And it's it doesn't change. Um, the default, it, 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 what it does is it asks you to question it and say, is this worth keeping? What do I want to keep from this? What part about this default describes a particular group of people in a particular place in my setting as opposed to just all of a type of fantasy peoples? So that's how I kind of saw it, but obviously <laughs> there was a bit more uh, uproar than that. And people are uh, legitimately upset. Um, and, and it's to those that think that something has been taken away, a default, a useful tool, um, that I'd really like to uh, hope that they get something out of this video because I looked at alignment a long time ago and said, I don't like this in my games. I, I don't like the the way that it seems to restrict players uh, and, and by their own like, <laughs> like voluntarily restriction. Uh, and, and I like the idea of monsters being redeemed, of monsters breaking uh, the, uh, the mold. Uh, and so I decided to sort of downplay and eventually remove alignment uh, from my D&D &D games. And I don't think it suffered uh, really at all. Um, but uh, before we get into that, uh, I want to talk about our uh, Patreon for just a second, because we do have a Patreon. If you'd like to support us over there, you can get access to all kinds of episodes. There's like over 222, 223 uh, episodes of our exclusive podcast. Um, plus, we've got ad-free audio of all of our uh, YouTube content over there as well. So uh, go and check that out if you want to uh, support us and our glorious endeavors. Why remove alignment in the first place? Like, 5th edition already has largely downplayed all of the mechanical uh, aspects to alignment. There's really not much left uh, for, for there to take out mechanically, but alignment still occupies uh, an important place in the narrative of D&D, especially in its implied uh, setting. Um, and so, like, I didn't like the fact that when I first ran Keep on the Borderlands, um, you know, I was, I was running it for a group of players who were uh, had been DM'd by very old school DMs uh, them, uh, themselves. They they had run through these very uh, challenging uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons adventures, and this was sort of my first foray into D and D. And I just instantly the the kind of instinct for hack and slash and uh, looking at the creatures of the Caves of Chaos and going like, well, that's just a place for loot and XP. Um, it was like, but it, it, yes, but like, you, what about it? What if you talk to them? Like, what if you've tried to figure out what they want? What if we live like every time an NPC comes into the game that the first thing that isn't on our minds is like, can we take its stuff? Can we kill it? Is it evil? Is there some justification for it? And for me, I found that like alignment really started becoming like a justification. That, uh, from my perspective as a DM, that there were moments in the game where it's like, well, we, we're good, so we can do X, Y, Z. And that was when I just decided uh, as a DM, so like, 
not, not anymore. Um, I, I, number one, that's not how it works <laughs> in the rules. That alignment is always uh, you know, described as tendencies, inclinations can change over time. It's not a straight jacket. It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. And so I said, don't write anything on your character sheets. If it comes up, we'll talk about your alignment. But otherwise, it's not something you need to worry about. I'll worry about it. And I presented the world that I wanted because I didn't want something that was too simplistic. I didn't want something that was like too restrictive. You know, I didn't want the players using it as an excuse to, uh, you know, do something and then feel like, oh, well, we're the good guys. We can get away with it. You know, I, I wanted them to say like, well, if, if we want to just take their stuff, then we've got to be honest about why we're doing it. That was uh, important to me even uh, in my, uh, you know, younger days of DMing. And like, honestly, I got tired of the arguments. I found alignment way too contentious. Everybody has an opinion on it. Alignment touches on our own personal views of morality. There's that weird line of like, where is my character? Where is myself? <laughs> when we start bringing morality into this, it's very easy to get uh, into areas that are sensitive and, and touch on people's like core beliefs and values. And in the middle of a elf game <laughs> where I just want to have some fun, heroic action, I didn't want those arguments interrupting things. I didn't want that rancor to become, uh, you know, a fester that split the group, that kind of thing. And I'd read stories about it all the time uh, of these things happening. So to me, those are all real good reasons to get rid of alignment. But what I found was that when I tried, there was this baked in setting that relies on alignment. And a lot of it starts with the outer planes and the gods and the way that alignment is, is expressed as a concept uh, on, a, on a cosmic scale, the way it kind of originally began as, a, as allegiance to a cosmic force of law or chaos. And then as the game was played, it became clear that like another axis, good and evil was needed to help uh, add more distinction. And like, I, I liked that part of it. I, I think that like, cosmic forces of supernatural power that that draw their energy or, or 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 potency from like the collective experience of mortals <laughs> seems really cool to me um and so i wanted to keep something like that uh, to keep alignment as a, a, a framework and a world building tool uh, for myself and for players who wanted the help uh, to get their character off the ground um, the idea of these supernatural cosmic forces did imply that there's some objectivity, like some standard by which an act can be judged good or evil, uh, lawful or chaotic. But like those were cosmic questions. Those weren't the concerns of in the dirt, first level rat killing PCs, right? Like that, they're, they're not playing at the level where these things matter yet, uh, but they will be. And so I, I wanted to keep that. Um, and then I did find it, it, there is value in a shared starting point. The reactions to the uh, Volos and Player's Handbook errata, like excluding the bad faith arguments, the arguments that were seem, seem to be made in good faith, where they're like, this is a tool I use for myself as a DM, or uh, you know, I've gotten value out of it as a player. Obviously, it is not that simplistic. Obviously, there's some nuance in area uh, for Gray, but like, if I'm going to subvert an expectation, I need to know what that expectation is in the first place. And like the quintessential sort of like outcast drow drist works because up until that point, drow were mostly villains. And to see a contrast, to see that complexity opened up that uh, part of the fantasy world to players to explore and to look at it like, wait, they're not just villains. They have something more going on. And I like that complexity in my D&D. I want that but I understand that there needs to be some kind of shared starting point. To me, this is something essential in session zero to set. Um, the, the sort of the tenor of it uh, can be set by the DM because they're doing a lot of world building, they're gonna be playing uh, the, you know, these NPCs, these creatures, but it's something that players ought to have input in because one of the classic problems of D&D is that you get a group of people together who made characters all on their own and the only thing they know is that they found someone who's finally willing to run a game for them. 
and someone shows up and they're wanting to do Harry Potter and someone else shows up and they're wanting to do Conan and someone else shows up and they're wanting to do some anime they saw that I'm not familiar with and then someone else shows up and wants to do Lord of the Rings and the DM was over here wanting to do something completely different from all of that and they didn't talk about it and they get into clashes and <laughs> personalities uh, you know uh, you know, in conflict with each other, you know, all kinds of bad stuff comes out of that. And like, just talking about the kind of game you want is where you can establish like, all right, I, I'm not, I'm looking for like a morally gray world where choice matters. And for me personally, what I wanted was you don't get to call yourself good just because you wrote it on your character sheet. Good requires sacrifice. It requires like putting your needs you know behind others like like what they need is more important and most of the people i played with play DD in a very cavalier mercenary fashion i see that as a feature i like that because it's freeing you don't usually get to do that with your life uh, and so in this fantasy game it's fun but if you wanted to be like lawful good like to reach that paragon like that was going to be tough but let's try it together was my thought I just didn't want the restriction from alignment. So shared uh, defaults, shared set of standard assumptions about the campaign world you're playing and the kind of fantasy that you got, the tone of the game, setting the, the baseline for that is gonna help a lot with this. Because when you remove alignment, you are removing a bit of uh, rails and boundaries a bit. There are people who rely on it to say like, well, my character is this alignment, that means there's something that are off limits nothing stopping them from still doing that <laughs> uh, when you remove alignment that's a choice of the player uh, on how they role play their character and is entirely in their hands so I feel like I've rambled on for a bit and this one's kind of a weird one because like I removed alignment a long time ago uh, during third edition when it did have a lot more mechanical weight and it, it took going through the spell lists and and you know the monsters and and really thinking about like all right what's it going to mean <laughs> whenever I get rid of um, th these things as mechanical objects as well as game objects uh, you know narrative elements rather and like fifth edition did a lot of that work for everybody already. There's not a lot of mechanics for it, but in the implied setting of D and D, like there's just things that you need to take into account if you're a dungeon master. And you're looking to really downplay alignment, remove it altogether, to think about and and then to consider. And these are the sort of like your starting position of, of, in that session zero of like, here's the kind of fantasy I'm looking for. This is how I'm looking to replace alignment or remove it or whatever. Um, so for me, a big one is the fact that the cosmology of D&D relies on alignment. Like souls when they die, <laughs> pass to the various outer plane that aligns with their moral outlook, you know, uh, provided that a god doesn't intervene uh, before then. Uh, the gods themselves have alignments, uh, which match the plane of alignment uh, that they're on. Like, Planescape is really interesting in that it like takes that premise of there's a bunch of outer planes, there's actually 16 of them, which sort of extrapolated from nine, and like, just really starts complicating the hell out of all of that. <laughs> you know, they start saying like, well, actually belief shapes reality out here. And, you know, there's all these contradictions about what the outer planes are like. They have physicality to them, but they're also infinite. Um, you, you pass through the astral plane to get to them, but they're also like a place of like, you know, physical adventure. People live here. This is their home, but it's also the afterlife. Like, it's just a glorious, wonderful mess. And it's worth considering, what do you want to do with that? Do you want to get rid of it? Do you want to not have the, that conception of the Outer Planes? For me, I liked thinking of the Outer Planes as a reflection of the Material Plane. The Outer Planes have the alignments they do because the mass experience of mortals on the Material Plane produces these Outer Planes. It, they, they didn't come first they are a, an emergent property of the material plane which in my particular view of the DD cosmology is is the center of everything the material plane is and everything else even though it's more fantastic and magical and maybe interesting is less important on a grand scale 
uh, the material plane is where it all comes together and gets mixed up. Um, and it's tied to the cycle of souls. Souls have worth in D&D. &D. They, they, they can be manipulated magically, they can be consumed, transformed, all that kind of stuff, right? So in my personal conception of D&D, &D, the forging of a soul from its birth, uh, on, on the, where the astral uh, sea meets the positive energy plane, uh, through the material plane where it experiences any number of lifetimes and sort of like gathers that experience and and you know It's a way of kind of like thinking of literal experience points <laughs> uh, and um, After it's done however many times it's going to go through uh, It passes on to the next uh, phase in its journey, which is uh, towards the outer planes and most of that never comes up in D&D It's a little nugget that I, I have in the background, but it informs how I think of alignment because alignment is a cosmic force that has supernatural power, but no mechanical weight. It's a soul acquires an alignment as an aggregate of its actions, and it literally aligns itself with one of the supernatural forces of the my particular conception of the D&D cosmos. They're no different than gravity or, or, or you know, <laughs> light, you know, they're just there. But I don't want any mechanical weight to it because I want the players to feel free to do what they want as they're playing. So this is all sort of deep background stuff for me where I kept alignment uh, and, and found some value in it, but also like feel like I'm accounting for the free will of uh, humanoids because I don't like inherently evil humanoids. I just don't. So yeah, that's the weird implied background that alignment uh, touches on. I don't think it's like the most important thing to think about, but it's a good place to start because the outer planes are sort of presented as these places for adventure and as sort of like exotic locales for D&D, &D, but they're also very much tied to this um, morality system that, uh, that is baked into the game. Where I really think that like conflict over alignment begins and, and, and gets heated is that D, D presents a world with objective morality and it says this is good this is evil uh, if you're a fan of older editions the uh, third edition books um, book of vile darkness and book of exalted deeds are worth tracking down because they have some of the best most nuanced takes on the various aspects of good and evil Right, like, what does it mean to be a good creature and engage in violence in D and D? What What are the criteria for it, in which violence is is not seen as evil or, or neutral, but actually, uh, you know, supporting the cause of good? And similarly with evil, like, what counts as evil <laughs> uh, in D and D? And so I think that, like, that might just make a lot of people uncomfortable. You know, like, objective morality isn't a thing we experience in our own lives uh, a lot of times it's used as a, a way to harm others or to justify some sort of oppression or, or like and like while i understand its value as a fantasy trope like i think having it having this objective morality the way it's presented in the game harms the game because it it, it puts a limit on player choice and if you say like, this is just these forces going on in the background and it informs the kind of villains I'm going to use. Yes, fiends are evil. You have no, kill as many as you want. Evil dragons are evil. Like that's all there because it's still D&D. &D. But like, you can't be sure when you look at another person that is any of the myriad humanoid species and races of D&D &D, that they are like a fiend or like a dragon. And you have a choice to make when you engage in violence with them over whether or not this is worth it to you, whether or not you think this is just. And while those things can bog down play, if you establish the expectations in session zero, they're less likely to. And then you present a world in which humanoids have free will, the choices that they make matter, and honestly, it opens the door to genuinely heroic behavior because now it's not something that you can just say like, well, yeah, I'm a hero because I wrote it on my character sheet. I'm a hero because it cost me something. I had to do something that, that, that was a sacrifice for myself that my character could have gained an advantage from because I wanted to be good. I wanted to go above and beyond what was necessary to help these NPCs to, to fix this thing. And like, that is what I personally have seen in getting rid of alignment because now whatever the players want to do is whatever they want to do. There's not like a crutch to fall back on. Uh, even if in the beginning they might have needed something like that, 
to get where they are now, right? So those are the things that I think are important to consider for when you're a DM looking to remove alignment. How are you going to adjust the cosmology for it? Uh, how are you going to explain the various aspects of the lore of D&D that touch on alignment? If you're going to say there is no alignment, don't write anything on your character sheet. It's not a thing. I think you can still play with those themes. I think good and evil are still interesting themes to play with in fantasy. I just think that as a game tool, especially on the player's side, it's worth getting rid of it. It's just, it, 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 it has not been used well across D&D's history. Decades of, of, of disagreement and rancor and broken friendships and bad times and bad vibes and, and a reputation of D&D as being simplistic and juvenile have come out of this system. That like immediately the creators of D&D had to start explaining and clarifying and that's why it's had many different permutations over the years. Just get rid of it, right? Just don't even worry about it anymore. You know, whatever is put in a rule book, you ignore it. You always could. You don't need anyone to tell you what to do with the rules of D&D. And yeah, I know that there's a lot of going back and forth over what's in a rule book and what's not. And uh, it's your game. What do you want out of this experience? What do your players want out of it? What kind of game do you want to enjoy together? I think that's what's really important. And the, the little kerfuffle over errata and uh, what it just it's not worth getting that invested in because you could always change these aspects of the game and there is always a default to fall back on and if the default is something you find odious and offensive then change it right do something different for your group and i think that dnd's declaration that you can do that and also that they are going to expunge the worst parts of dnd's floor which is problematic as shit right they're going to make a good faith effort to try to do that and that this is one of those steps like that's good right this doesn't really harm individual games you can always do whatever you want it's an it's a clarification of what is there and an affirmation of the dms and the group's ability to say i like this i don't like that i want this in my game i don't want that and that's a good thing for dnd because if everybody's just playing the same D&D the same way everywhere, that's boring. It's better when we can all approach this game the way we want to and change it into something that we like. So that when we play with new people, they get to experience a different kind of D&D and broaden their own horizons for the game. So <clears throat> if you'd like a more rambling talk uh, about this subject and many others, uh, be sure to check out WebDM Talks on all podcasting apps. If you like the video, uh, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, everything that we have to do to propitiate uh, the algorithm uh, patron that we uh, packed in our lives away to. It was a voluntary one, but nevertheless. And <laughs> if you uh, haven't already, you can check out uh, uh, our book over pre-order. And mm, that was about, that's about, this one's the one where I'm, my words have just failed me. You can pre-order our book over on Backerkit. You can pre-order our book over on Backerkit. Thank you uh, very much for the rescue, Eva. Um, <laughs> we're hard at work finishing it up right now, which is part of the reason I'm brain damaged. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see uh, where we're at. See you next week. Check out the link in the description. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't want to do that one.